And now today's word at the Key Church. Okay, praise God. Let's get into the word. The title of my message this morning is Shanty Town. So uh, on Monday uh, is the start of Sukkot. I want to ask you this morning, is it a big deal or isn't it? Let's play a little game. Big deal, little deal. It's a big deal. But you know that all around the world, uh, churches celebrate Passover or Easter. They celebrate Pentecost. But very few churches even know that it is Sukkot. It's one of the feasts of the Lord. It's not the Jews' feasts. It's not the Christians' feast. It's the feast of the Lord. Uh, and it's a special feast. And so, we need to be aware of this feast. And um, in King James English, you can call it the Festival of Booths. Uh, I want to call it Shanty Town. Okay? So, uh, Sukkot is like all the other feasts. It is multi-dimensional points to more than just one thing. It's a historic picture of the Hebrews leaving Egypt. But it's also a prophetic picture of the fact that we will tabernacle with God one day. So it goes from far back in history to far forward in history. It's more than just a one-dimensional uh, facet. It, it is multifaceted like a diamond. It speaks of slavery to freedom for the Jewish people. Uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful prophetic picture. So the very first day of freedom for the Jewish people, they were in a city called Ramses. Because that was uh, where they were forced to do their slave labor. And um, you, you know, the meaning of words is so important. What does Ramses mean? The place where these Jews were in slavery. It means the evil has melted like wax. Who would name their city the evil has melted like wax? That's the meaning of the word. Uh, I love to say it. Uh, somebody better check me on this. I, I, I say it too often. You can't make this stuff up, folks. It's incredible. The evil has melted like wax. So they left Ramses, these Jewish people that have now got their freedom. And excluding the people who uh, listened to me share this yesterday, Let's see how smart this church is, because this is a smart church. You people know the times and the seasons, I think, better than most churches, okay? What was the name of the place where God took them to first? They left Ramses, and as they were leaving, the evil was melting like wax. But where did they go to? I've got three chocolates. And somebody put an offering in there. I can even dish out some cash. Question. Sorry? <laughs> you must listen properly. Listen carefully. They traveled from Ramses, and the first place they went to was Sukkot. Now, isn't that interesting? Because every other feast... Um, points to a day, points to a time, point, but Sukkot, they say, points to the 40 years in the desert. No, no, okay, it can point to that too, but it points to a day, it points to a time. It points to the fact that the very first place when you come out of slavery is Sukkot, which speaks of freedom and the melting away of the evil over your life. So folks, there was no more slave masters. It's their first night 
in the desert. You know, if you've been under slavery, if you've been under sin, how wonderful it is to come into freedom. No slave masters, nobody to drive you anymore. You're free to do your own thing. But you know what they missed? In Egypt, they had brick houses and fluffy white bread. And they missed that. What does that speak to? The houses speaks to uh, having a, a, a dwelling, having a roof over your head, and bread speaks to food. The two most basic requirements of humankind. You, you need shelter and you need food. And it was the two things that they gave up. It was the two things that they left behind and they went into freedom and now they had to depend on God for food and shelter. But you know what? They were free. And I want to tell you, when we put ourselves in God's hands, which is what those Jewish people did, and I'm not just preaching this as a history lesson. I'm preaching it as something that can make your spirit man come alive today. When you put yourself in God's hands like that, you say, I give up my house. I give up my guarantee of food, uh, this nice fluffy white bread that we got in Egypt. And uh, I put my life in God's hands. What happens then? What happened on that very first night, the night of Sukkot, the night that Jewish people are remembering all around the world from Monday for the next few days? A cloud came. It wasn't an ordinary cloud. Today we've got some clouds outside. You might even get a little bit of rain if you're lucky. But it wasn't that type of a cloud. It was a glory cloud. And I want to tell you, God wants to pour out His glory over you when you put your trust in Him. When you lay down the things of the flesh, the things that are important to the flesh, and you say, I will follow you. You lead on, Master God. I will follow you. If you take me through the desert, I'm following you there. Where you lead, I will follow then you should experience the glory cloud. The reason we don't experience the glory is because we're not ready to give up anything. Our sins, our flesh, our, uh, and we do things our own way. But folks, you're a minute away, you're an inch away from coming under the glory cloud when you are ready to say, I commit my life 100% to you. I lay down all these things that I think are important and I trust God for supernatural guidance and provision. My life is in God's hand. There's a glory cloud on its way. Folks, that was a teaching, a brief teaching out of the Old Testament. But today I want to shift us into the New Testament. Because I want this glory cloud to manifest. Uh, and I need us to understand, as much as I love the old covenant, there's something more powerful about the new covenant for your life today. So I'm going to go to the book of Hebrews. And let's ask a question. Should Hebrews even be included in the Bible? Who wrote the book? Who wrote the book of Hebrews? Possibly, maybe, could be Paul. But you know what? We don't know. We don't even know who wrote the book. The one thing I can tell you, it's a radical book. And that's perhaps why I love it so much. It's a powerful book. So why was the book of Hebrews written? Most of the other books that were written by Paul were addressed to a particular congregation. And so we can assume too that this was addressed to a Hebrew congregation. To a messianic community. To people, Jewish people that were following the Messiah, following Jesus. But their faith was faltering 
because of a strong Jewish influence. And it was all around the discussion of the law. And folks, I want the word to set us free today. But I want the glory cloud to come. So we're going to read from the message because it's nice and easy to understand. Uh, Hebrews 7, 11. Uh, and I don't even want to comment too much on some of these scriptures because I'll get in trouble with theologians all over the place. So let's just let the word speak for itself and let the word say what it says. If the priesthood of Levi and Aaron, which provided the framework for the giving of the law, could really make people perfect, there wouldn't have been need for a new priesthood like that of Melchizedek. Wow, that's powerful, folks. There wouldn't have been need. I mustn't say too much. I'm going to get myself in trouble. And I promise you, I love the Old Covenant perhaps more than all of you. But I understand it was all a pointing towards Jesus. It was a shadow. But the New Covenant is the real deal. It's no longer a shadow. Jesus has come. Verse 12, perhaps one of the most powerful New Testament uh, understandings of, of how this all works. But since it didn't get the job done, what is it speaking about? The uh, covenant with Abraham. Since it didn't get the job done, the Bible says, there was a change of priesthood which brought with it a radical new kind of law. I, I've got to emphasize that because I want you to get the point and I Desperately trying not to say too much. A radical new kind of law. A radical new kind of law. And this church knows what that new law was. It's all about love. That's the new law. There's no way of understanding this in terms of the old Levitical priesthood. Which is why there is nothing in Jesus' family tree connecting him with the priestly line. But the Melchizedek story provides a perfect analogy. Jesus, a priest like Melchizedek. Not by genealogical descent, but by the sheer force of resurrection life he lives. Priests forever in the royal order of Melchizedek. The former way of doing things, a system of commandments that never worked out the way it was supposed to, was set aside. Folks, we can have theological debates about these things. Today I'm just reading it to you in the Word, okay? And you can fight me on it. You're going to fight with the Word. It says, was set aside. What was set aside? The former way of doing things. A system of commandments that never worked out the way it was supposed to was set aside. I hope this is bringing revelation to somebody. The law brought nothing to maturity. Another way, Jesus. A way that does work, that brings us right into the presence of God, is put in its place. Wow, this is revelation. The old priesthood of Aaron perpetuated itself automatically, father to son, without explicit confirmation by God. What is that saying? That Eli had two sons and they were rubbishes. But you know what? They were next in line to be the priest. That's what that scripture is saying. And that didn't work so well for God. Because he didn't like to have a rubbish high priest. He wanted somebody that he could appoint. And he did appoint. He appointed Jesus. 
Verse 21 goes on to say, But then God intervened and called this new permanent priesthood into being with an added promise. God gave his word. He won't take it back. You're the permanent priest. Jesus. Permanent, permanent priest. This makes Jesus the guarantee of a far better way between us and God. One that really works. A new covenant. Some of my friends don't like me to use the word old and new. But it's in the Bible, folks. It says a new covenant. And I understand where they're coming from and I love them. But we've got to follow what the word says. It's a new covenant. Otherwise you can get stuck. In the old covenant. And God is wanting to do a new thing. Earlier there was a lot of priests for they died and had to be replaced. But Jesus' priesthood is permanent. He's there from now to eternity. To save everyone who comes to God through him. Always on the job to speak up for them. So now we have a high priest who perfectly fits our needs. Completely holy, uncompromised by sin, with authority, extending as high as God's presence in heaven itself. Unlike the other priests, he doesn't have to offer sacrifices for his own sins. But every day before he can uh, get around to us and our sins, he's done it once and for all. Offered up himself as the sacrifice. The law appoints as high priests men who are never able to get the job right. But this intervening command of God, which came later, appoints the Son who is absolutely, eternally perfect. Absolutely, eternally perfect. And I know people are very critical of the modern day message. And they will say, it's not a Bible, it's paraphrased. Have you heard that? Yeah. Oh, it's not a Bible, it's paraphrased. We'll go read on the cover. And I quote, the message is a personal paraphrase of the Bible in English. That's what it says on the cover. So don't get bent out of shape. It's what the author said. He said, this is not an exact um, translation. It's a paraphrase. And so don't throw stones at it and say, oh, it's... no, they know it's a paraphrase. That's how it was written. What a wonderful man Peterson was to take the whole Bible and paraphrase it. Not one of us have done that. It's a lot of hard work. But he did it. And now people just want to criticize him. Okay, but I know there's those of us, old school, we like the King James, don't we? I'll tell you what's better than the King James. The parallel Bible. And I've got it on my computer. Where I can open four different translations at once. One of them will be the King James. One of them will be the message. One will be the American Standard Version, probably. And maybe the last one will be the Contemporary English Version. But you can put different ones in there. And then you read all four. And if you have the programs that I have, you can go and read it in the Greek or the Hebrew as well. It helps people like me that don't speak Hebrew or Greek to just follow the numbers. It's like painting by number, okay? You can check out the original meaning of every word. But so some people just get stuck on uh, the, uh, get stuck on only one version. Even the King James Version doesn't bring the fullness like some of the others can that is just more contemporary English and easier for you and I to understand. And so it's beautiful. 
So can I give it to you in the King James Version? For the priesthood being, and I'm only doing verse 12. For those that say, oh, well, he was maybe just reading it in the message. King James Version. For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. I'm talking about theological stuff now that theologians debate about uh, what is the standing of the old covenant, what is the standing of the new covenant. We can fight about these things. I don't want to fight about it. I just want to tell you what the word says. And this is King James. So you can't fight me on this now. This is not message. There is made of necessity a change also of the law. And I added in my own words. Let that sink in. The establishment is under new management, folks. There's a new high priest. Wonderful as those old high priests were. I think of Samuel. What a wonderful man. Think of Levi, the father of the priests. Think of Aaron, Moses' brother, who went to meet him in the desert when he was coming. Think of Eli, uh, who wasn't so perfect as the Bible points out, but he prayed for Hannah and she brought forth Samuel, who was one of the greatest priests and prophets to that nation. Think of Caiaphas, also a high priest, the very one who condemned Jesus to die. Not one of them was perfect. But today I don't want to focus on them. I want to focus on my high priest. His name is Jesus. There's no one like him. Never was, never will be. Stands alone, separate, above. Jesus, the great high priest. Hebrews 4.14 says, now, they, uh, now that we know what we have, Jesus, this great high priest, with ready access to God, let's not let it slip through our fingers. We don't have a priest who is out of touch with our reality. He's been through weakness and testing, experienced it all, all but the sin. All but the sin, the Bible says. So let's walk right up to him and get what he is so ready to give. Take the mercy, accept the help. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There hath no temptation taken us, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful. I think that would have been a good place for somebody to say amen. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above what you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape, that you may be able to bear it. One of my favorite scriptures, Romans 1 verse 20 for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and guarded, so that we are without excuse. The things that are made. You look at the sunrise, you look at the sunset, you look at the waves, you look at the sea, you look at the mountains, you look at the trees. Yesterday as we were driving out to Paul, the beauty of the mountains, from whence cometh my help, immediately comes to mind. See, the beauty of the mountains, the beauty of the sunset. I want to tell you that we are without excuse. So I want to ask you this morning, so what's your excuse? If this is who Jesus is, he's made a new and a better way. And he's the perfect great high priest. 
and he loves you and he calls you to himself what is your excuse Oh, Pastor, you don't understand. I've been so hurt by Sister Crooked Toe, and I've been so hurt by Brother Whoever. And I've been so disappointed in the church, Pastor. Get over yourself. Get over it. And, and you know, one of the favorite ones I've been overlooked been overlooked they made a new management team in the church and they didn't put me on it and I've been faithful for five months <laughs> get over yourself you know my daughter knows me so well although I must say it's not what it used to be things they are changing but before I go into her room, she will say, Dad, I know I need to clean my room. And I haven't said a word. She says it to me. Dad, I know I need to. But does she intend to clean it? No. <laughs> but we as Christians, we're exactly the same. We can even quote Matthew 28, 19. Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations. That's what God's called us to do. And whatsoever you c uh, command me. Go and make disciples. And whatsoever you command me. But do we do it? No. We can quote it like my daughter. Dad, I know I need to clean my room. But I'm not going to do it. Dad, I know I need to make disciples, but no. Can I bring you this morning, for those more traditional ones amongst us, Jesus' red letter edition, solemn warning. Revelations 2 verse 5. Remember therefore whence you are fallen, and repent and do the first works, or else... I come to thee and will remove thy candlesticks out of its place, except thou repent. You see, I even used a verse with thee in it, so you can just feel the weightiness of the King James. But I don't want to end on that worrisome note. Let's end on something more positive, also out of Revelations 3.5. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. The one who conquers. The one who does what God says that we're supposed to do. And verse 6 goes on to say, who, He who has an ear... Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And the Holy Spirit is speaking to the church this morning. Folks, we're going into the days of tabernacle. If you drive through Seapoint, you'll see even on the stoops, palm leaves, where they make their sukkah, where they're going to celebrate that first night of coming out of slavery. And the 40 years following it, where Jesus led them through the desert, they're going to celebrate Sukkah. Can we as the church that have a much greater redemption? Folks, I, I read to you about what the new covenant says, that that was wonderful, but that there's now a new and a better way. Not my words, the Bible's words. A new and a better way that our high priest, Jesus has made for us. Should we not celebrate Sukkah? Should we not celebrate the prophetic aspect of it? That Jesus is coming for his bride and then we are going to tabernacle, we're going to booth, we're going to shanty town it with our God. But you know what? With God it can't be a shanty town. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be wonderful. Let him who has an ear 
hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And when we get this revelation, if you'll allow God to put this revelation on the inside of you, that there's a new and a better way and you are part of that. And that if we'll start to uh, st stop quoting what we know, like going back to my daughter, Dad, I know I must clean my room, but don't worry, I'm not going to do it. Stop quoting Scripture. Just do Scripture. Just live Scripture. When we s get that change of mind, when we allow, then you come under the glory cloud. Oh, if somebody will get this this morning. God wants to send His glory cloud right here, right now, into this little humble church. Just ordinary people. But people that will say, God, I get it. Jesus is the only way. He's my high priest. And I'm going to do what He says. And I'm going to celebrate the sukkah. I'm going to take note of the fact that it's got a prophetic word that we're going to dwell one day with Jesus when he comes to fetch his bride. We're going to have a glory time. But it speaks even to now. It speaks to today. I want to see a glory cloud come over my life and over yours. It's about coming into that place of letting go of the past. If you want to go back to Egypt, you can go back. There's pots of food in Egypt, and there's stone houses, and there's that sense of uh, you've got a place, and your food is guaranteed, but you're going to be a slave, my friend. But if you want to come out into freedom and say, Lord Jesus, I give up my whole life, I, I give it to you as a living sacrifice. Now you come under a glory cloud. The glory is getting ready to manifest over your life. Is there anybody here that says, Pastor, that's me. I want to live in Glory Avenue under glory cloud. Why don't you stand with me, please? Lord, we've got so many complaints against you because things don't work out in our life, but we're living in Do My Own Way Avenue. I did it my way. And then we wonder why nothing supernatural, unusual, marvelous doesn't take place in our life. Because you did it your way. Because I do it my way. Uh, we got to quit doing things our way. And start doing things His way. we got to come under the glory cloud. we got to live in the supernatural. Lord, I'm desperate. I'm desperate for a shift in my own life. For a shift in this church. That we come under the glory cloud. That we live in glory avenue. That the miraculous becomes the usual, the normal, the everyday of our life. Come on, repent, folks. Repent with me. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, you're such a great high priest. And we've been doing our own thing for too long. Today I repent publicly before these people and before the throne of God. I want to move in the glory. I want to dwell in the glory. I want to know the supernatural provision of God over my life. I don't want to blame you for my own problems. I don't want to blame you for my disobedience, for my doing things my way. I want to repent. I repent. I repent. I repent, Lord. We need your glory. We need to tabernacle with you. We need to dwell with you. And we've got a new and a better way. Oh, God.
those great prophets and priests that went ahead of us, Lord. They weren't perfect, but in a sense they saw more miracles than what we see. Because, Lord, we don't understand the fullness of the gospel. We live in a limited revelation of the authority that we have. We can speak to mountains and they'll move. But we're complaining about mountains. Right now, Lord, I want to take the opportunity to step into some glory. Just have a little glory moment and pray for every person that's sick in this place. Satan, you're a liar. You're a deceiver. You have no place in anybody in this building. I declare health over you. That's part of the provision. They, their shoes never wore out. Their clothes never wore out. They, they stayed in health. They were able to walk. Half of us can't even walk very far. And we have a new and a better covenant. Oh God, we repent of living so in the shadows. We want to come out into the light of the glory of the gospel. And right now, I pray for every sickness. I pray for every disease. Go in Jesus' name. Go, I said. Go, go, go. I pray over the family relationships in this place. Too many broken relationships for too long. I command healing. I command healing. Satan, you will bow to the name of Jesus. A new and a better way. I command the healing of the Lord over relationships. All family relationships will come in line with the Word of God. The sons will return to the fathers and the fathers to the sons and the mothers to the daughters and the daughters to the mothers and the husbands to the wives and the siblings and restoration! I speak to your finances. Supernatural breakthrough living under the cloud glory provision in Jesus name every need met nothing broken nothing missing the hand of God the hand of God the hand of God upon your purses upon your bread basket you will give and not borrow I come against every mindset that is not in line with the word of God everything that we speak with our mouth that I'm just a little this or a little that that we don't expect much from a good God. Lord, we repent for our feeble speech. Your word says we'll be the head and not the tail. We'll be above and not beyond, uh, beneath. I speak to every false word that we've spoken over our lives. We will be the blessed of the Lord. Will somebody say, I'm blessed. I'm blessed. I'm going to tabernacle. I'm going to tabernacle with Jesus. One day I'm going to dwell with Him in eternity. But for a year now, we're going to come under the glory cloud. I release a glory cloud over your home. Every enemy that comes against your home. Oh, in Jesus' name, the presence of God will be strong in your home. Thank you. 
Lord, I thank you for your breakthrough anointing that's in this place. And I pray that each one now receive it in Jesus' name.